Islam family. <laughs> Islam family we have here before us Thomas Muhammad Eel out of the Republic of Arizona. And he has uh, blessed us with a portion of his time to give us a brief about the Moore Science Temple. And thank you for coming tonight. Oh, thank you for having us. Yeah, definitely. All right. And Thomas, uh, what? Let's start like this. Let's start like this. Tell us a little bit about yourself and direct that toward what brought you to the Moore Science Temple. Because those of us that know a little bit about you know that before you became a part of the Moore Science Temple, you were already conscious and a very aware person. So you weren't somebody who was just out here in the mainstream like everyone else, you know, thinking that this nation and this world is exactly how it's presented to us. You you knew quite a bit already. But yet and still you decided to become a part of this body known as the Moore Science Temple. Tell us tell us about yourself and why you joined. Uh, excellent question, but before we go there, let me uh, rise into my highest heights, giving all perfect praise to Allah, Father of the universe, giving all of the honor and praise to those great worthies who have come down the line of divine, mainly Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, and Confucius, and knowing something about those four individuals, those four Hebrew Muslims, we can talk to the entire planet, uh, extending those high honors to our National Grand Sheik, uh, National Grand Sheik Joel Bratton Bay, and to the man of the hour, the man that we are here to discuss today, the Honorable Prophet Noble Drew Ali, in his first, second, and third form. Uh, extending those honors to our National Grand Body in Baltimore, Maryland, to all of our Sheiks, Sheikesses, Deputy Sheiks, Deputy Sheikesses, to our friends, family, and most important, Importantly, to our future, our children, I'd like to greet everyone with the greeting words of Islam, 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 peace, peace, peace. Yes, that is a very interesting question. Uh, how did I get into uh, Morris science? And very interesting because Morris, Morris, the way I came, I really, I started, my quest starts really with the Nation of Islam. That is my foundation. Uh, it's NOI for life. Um, Minister Farrah Khan and, and is really my spiritual father who nursed me into consciousness. And I find uh, that a lot of us are not conscious of our consciousness. So I got my start in the nation, just like anyone else coming into the nation of Islam, you know, looking at the condition of 40 to 50 million so-called black people in this country and throughout the diaspora and wanting to do something different, wanting to make a difference. So we got involved with the Nation of Islam and went through the classes and the training modules and became a FOI, if you will, and did a lo whole lot of study and was blessed somewhere in my development. I was blessed to relocate from Miami, Florida to Phoenix, Arizona to co really come out here to go to school. I had no intention of staying out here at all. I had every intention of going back uh, to live in Fort Lauderdale at that time. Uh, but I know a lot would have a different plan for me. Uh, I got here to Arizona and I remember flying into, uh, coming back from California to visit my father. And I was walking through Sky Harbor Airport here in Phoenix and I had on an FOI hat, and one of the brothers in the mosque um, by the name of Brother Islam saw me, and he said, Brother, are you an FOI? And I was a little short with the brother. I said, listen, I said, only FOI can wear an FOI hat. So he got on the phone, apparently, and went and called our captain, which is the, the man, the man, trainer of the men of the Army, you know, and he 
And next thing I knew, you know, <laughs> I'm at the mosque and that wasn't my intention. My intention was to fly into Arizona incognito, do my little school, get my education and go back to go back to Florida. And fast forward, here we are now going on 30 years coming in and out of Arizona and I've made it my home. It's, 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 I love this place, you know, the scenery, the mountains and whatnot. And then somewhere I left, I left Arizona. I went back to Florida and, uh, just to kind of repair and, and kind of get myself together and figure out what I want to do with the second half of my life. Um, I just needed a break. And, um, that's where I ran into more science. You know, I never forget it though. Um, my first contact with anything to do with more science. I mean, we knew of a man named Prophet Noble Ali, but didn't really know too much about him. I just knew the name. Uh, I didn't know anything about his teaching per se, um, but that still came through the nation. Uh, so it was really a brother I'm sure we're familiar with, Taj Tariq Bay. I saw a video of him and I have never heard anybody you know, demonstrate law like that. He was saying some things that were totally above my head. And I was warned, <laughs> don't watch all this brother videos in one sitting and, you know, being hard headed and being intrigued. I wanted to go through all the videos and I did. And we didn't go to work the next day. You know, we sitting around watching Taj Tariq Bay videos. Uh, and then it, uh, the experience kind of fell off. You know, it kind of fell off for me. Uh, I didn't entertain it because, again, I was in the nation. So that that's my that's my foundation. And next thing I know, um, I get a call from Brother James Muhammad Eel, now formerly James Muhammad, formerly <laughs> James Thurman, out here, who was uh, Minister Farrakhan's chief of security of the Phoenix Palace. And we are very close. We're actually brother-in-laws at this point. <laughs> so. <clears throat> You know, being around James automatically put me around Minister Farrakhan uh, in a very intimate way. Uh, that's not something that I was seeking. It's just something that that's the way the chips fell for me. Some people think that's a blessing. That could also be a curse. <laughs> it just depends on how you handle it. Um, but it was a blessing for me because I got a chance to, to be up close to the man that I love and admire. You know, and watch him interact with his family and watch him deal with, you know, the problems of our people up close and personal. But then, you know, James Muhammad Hill introduced me to more science. He called me and I'll never forget this phone call because he called me and I was in Orlando, Florida at the time. And he said, hey, man, how you doing? You know, long time no hear from. I was like, yes, sir. You know, he was like, got something I need you to check out. You know, and I said, all right, what is it? You know, and he gave me the website, MoorishAmericanNationalRepublic.com. He said, just check it out in your leisure, you know, and then, you know, get back to me when you can, and we'll talk about it. Honest to God, I think it probably was, I probably called him back three, four minutes later. And this is, a, this is what I said to him after we gave each other the greetings. I said, man, this is a government. <laughs> Say, this is a government and he was like yep i said man what is this all about you know he started talking a little bit about nationality of course i didn't know anything about nationality i was like what do you mean nationality what does that mean you know but i was intrigued so you know i started reviewing stuff on the website and you know i got myself enrolled real quick just based on what he said i got enrolled into our school of law and history and but I guess the rest is history. I mean, it's uh, been a been a very interesting ride. And had somebody told me then, several years ago, that I would be sitting here doing an interview representing um, the Moorish American National Republic under the leadership of National Grand Chief Joel Bratton Bay, and somebody told me that a few years ago, I'd have laughed. <laughs> I'd have laughed in your face because I'd have been like, well, that because that wasn't my desire either. But I, I did have a desire to understand the information. And I could see the impact of how this information dealing with nationality had got us as a collective people twisted up. Um, 
And so I, I, started, I got into classes. I graduated the School of Law and History, and here we are, you know, here we are. So that's, I don't know if that answered your question, but that, uh, that's how we got started. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And one of the things that I've heard said about the Moorish American National Republic is this idea of citizenship and and who we are, those of us who call ourselves black or African American. And I've been I've been told that the question to ask is, are we citizens? What's that about? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, are we citizens? If you ask the average person on the street, whether they're Asiatic of Asiatic descent or whether they're European of European descent, if you ask them, are you a citizen? You're going to get a myriad of answers. You know, of course, you're in the United States, so of course you're, you're a citizen. Yes, I'm a citizen. And you'll get that resounding yes. But then if you follow, do, that, do a follow-up question, what law makes you a citizen? Ask them to prove that to you. The average person that you're going to run into will not be able to tell you what law makes them a citizen will not be able to answer that question. Now, that's very profound because if you're living in a country <laughs> and you are swearing your strongest oath that you are a citizen, and then someone asks you, well, what law makes you a citizen? And then you go to hemming and hawing and looking up into the sky, then there's the problem. At best, at best, our people are going to tell you, I'm a citizen through the 14th Amendment. But we don't know the history, the historical context of the 14th Amendment. We do not know that the 14th Amendment was struck down as unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1883. We don't, we don't have a clue. And, and, you know, so we're just running around yelling and screaming and pretending and feeling that we do have a citizenship that we really don't have. And I hope that's one of your questions coming up because I would like to delve into what a U.S. citizen really is lawfully, not emotionally, not socially, not what you think it is, what it actually is. And when we get to the actual facts and get away from the emotionalism and get away from the theory, we're going to find out that we are not who we think we are. You see? And that's going to put a burden and a responsibility on us as a collective people to change our behavior and the way we deal with things. And then we're, you know, squarely going to understand why we are being dealt the hand that we are being dealt. You know, and as I've said on many occasions, it's not racism. That's too easy. It's racism. It's not racism. It's birthright and identity theft. That's what it really is. Mm -hmm. I, I watch the news. We have this election coming up. And all the while, we still see those of us who call ourselves black and African American being shot in our homes, uh, pulled over for a minor traffic offense and end up being killed, though we're unarmed. Those of us are being just uh, it appears to be targeted by authorities, police, random uh, Caucasian people, or people from other races calling the police and other authorities on black people. And I see on social media, on TV, even in movies, the question keeps coming up over and over again. Why are black people under attack? What's behind it? And why are they getting away with it? That's an excellent question. <laughs> and there's a mirror there's a there's a lot of ways we can answer that. But, you know, we teach in our Moorish paradigm that law governs all affairs. 
law governs all affairs, okay? And we've never considered, are we lawful in this country? Are we citizens in this country? We've been taught that we are, but many of us, matter of fact, most of us have never researched these things for ourselves. We've never plumbed the depth of it because when you plumb the depth of it, you, 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 you may not like the answer. And then the answer is going to force you to be responsible for what you know. And we don't want to be responsible and we really don't want to be accountable as a collective. We really don't. You see? So we suffer and we continue to suffer and we continue to sing out and yell out and pray in and weigh in. And we've done everything that a citizen should do, but we haven't gotten justice yet. See? So, you know, here we are in 2020 in the face of a presidential election. And we think that by voting this one in or voting that one out, that that somehow will give us justice. See, when the reality is voting <laughs> is not going to get you anywhere because there is no economics backing up your vote. And the political arena is run by economics, finance business and we haven't taken care of business you know my mother had a saying when i was a little boy she would tell me all the time mind your business <laughs> you understand and we need to do that we need some inner reflection as a collective people and we need to start mining our business you know nationality is the order of the day that's not my slogan you know we have to understand what a nationality is. Everybody has a nationality if you are a natural person. So let's, let's get at it. Let's see what we're talking about. A nationality ties you to a nation. A nation has borders, people, culture. It has a constitution. It has a flag. A nation has a government seal that represents it to the family of nations. So now we have collectively 50 million people running around describing themselves as an adjective. Right. See, an adjective, I'm black. Black according to science. Black according to political science. Let's not get it twisted. I'm talking about political science specifically. Law governs all affairs. That is run by political science. That's political science. So black, according to political science, is death. What do I mean by that? Civilis motus, meaning you have no rights by your own admission. Now, we've never been taught this. See? We are operating as a collective people on what is called a granted privilege. It's like no different than your driver's license. It can be revoked at any moment because it's not a right. Your, driving license, your driver's license is a privilege. And I'm not getting into, at this point in the interview, I'm not getting into, well, you know, brother, the Constitution say, and no, I'm not trying to talk above your head. I'm just trying to get people to think. You see? We are the only people being shot down on camera and no one seems to be being punished. Could it be that we are outside of the law? We say, well, the system is broken. No, the system is not broken. It is working exactly the way it was designed to work for the slaves. We are slaves right now in 2020. We don't want to believe that because the chains have been taken off. No, you're not a physical slave. You're not being held physically. You're being held legislatively. You're a slave on paper. And since this is a paper government, I'm talking about the United States. Since this is a paper government, meaning 
everything you want to do in this man's society, you have to fill out a form. You want a job, you got to fill out a job application. You want Social Security benefits, they got a form for that. <laughs> you want medical benefits, they got another form for that. Got birth certificates, Social Security card, all of that's paperwork. It's a governmental form. We believe, you know, we think that by voting someone out or voting someone in, we're going to, you know, this is going to change our reality. Last year, or maybe earlier this year, President Donald Trump said, just because you are born here, that doesn't make you a citizen. Now, we laughed at the, at the, at the interview that he did. You know, this man is crazy. You know, because when you read the 14th Amendment, it says anyone born or naturalized in the United States is a citizen subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. You know, socially, we like, see, right there, the president had lost his mind. Well, no, the president was right on point. He was right on point. See, he was trying to tell the so-called black man, Negro, African-American, or whatever we feel like calling ourselves today, he was trying to tell you something about the law. Just because you were born here doesn't make you a citizen. And if you are a citizen, as I said on many occasions, we're not going to argue with you about whether you are a citizen or not. Because there are different types of citizens. Right now, uh, black people are at the bottom of the citizenship pool. You are not a citizen according to the true definition of that word, citizen, as meant and intended for the United States Constitution. We're outside of that document. So if you are outside of the Constitution and the Constitution does not grant rights, the Constitution protects rights. So if you are outside of that document, then you have no rights that no one is bound to respect. You see, not because of what I say, that's just how it is. But of course, emotionally, we don't, we, we, we're not, psychologically, we can't deal with that. Oh, I'm a citizen. I was born here. My grandmama was here. My great grandmama was here, and so on and so forth. And eventually, we were slaves here. Tell me something about who you were before you were a slave. All of a sudden, we start drawing a blank. See? What happened to you that you can't tell me what your people and ancestors were prior to 1500? We, we were from Africa. Africa is a, a continent with 54 nation states on it. Which one are you from? Oh, no. <laughs> see? See? Just silly. Emotional. See? Your, your history, is you've been cut off from your history, and that's like having a tree without roots. You're dead. So the word, as Elijah Muhammad said, you're a Negro, so-called Negro. That's not who you are. That's why he put the word so-called there, so-called black man, so-called Negro, so-called African-American, because you are a tree without roots. And if you don't have a root, you don't have a foundation. Everything is rooted in nationality you see you want to be a black man according to law okay be black but then give me the give me the noun that the adjective is described i'll wait give me the noun because a noun is a person place thing or idea an adjective is that which describes a noun so black is the adjective what's the noun i don't know see we're getting a whole lot of i don't know See, that's the problem. Birthright and identity theft and a political election is not going to change that reality. The law is what it is. You see, and the law right now is against us because of our position in this country that we absolutely refuse to change. We are waiting on some great benevolent white man or woman to come into office and treat us right. And as Elijah Muhammad said, if a man will not teach you right, what makes you think he will treat you right? This, these are basic concepts. 
basic concept. And it's just beyond me how we could leave our sisters for much less offense, <laughs> but won't leave the European. <laughs> it's just beyond me, you see, just beyond me. So no, I don't care who sits in the Oval Office. It's not going to change our condition. Matter of fact, our condition is going to get much, much worse until we let them go. The European has already let us go. We refuse to let them go. And we have fallen in love with our second class citizenship. And this is why we're getting beat up on camera, choked out, stomped out, shot. And we've done everything. Then we did. We went to church. Church is not going to stop you from getting stomped out. Not going to stop. That's not going to that's not going to help. Uh, matter of fact, wasn't it a young European fellow walked into a church and shot it up? And then they took the young fella for some hamburgers. Must have been hungry after doing that killing spree. Did we pray about that? Did we did we pray for those that spitefully misused us? See, I want us to really start thinking about the ideologies we have in our head. Did we sing that away? Did we love everybody? That's funny because everybody don't love us. And apparently we don't love each other enough to change that reality. You know? So no, there will be no political answer <laughs> coming because it's not a political problem. It's something wrong with us and the way we think. And as long as we think the way we think, we're going to continue to do the same old song. And what is the clinical definition of insanity? Doing the same thing the exact same way, but you expect a different result. And we have done the same thing the same way since 1960. And we still expect the same people to give us a different result. And I'll put one more last little point on that with the constitution they say well we have laws on the books yeah you do have laws on the books we amended the, the constitution yes they did amend it it's very amendable but what we're waiting on is and what i'd like to see is show me where so-called white folks have amended their behavior show me that you amended some paperwork show me where you amended your behavior other people come to this country and they are socially engineered to view us a certain way because everything that we do amongst ourselves, we view ourselves through the eyes of so-called white people. You see, we do. Okay. And we view them through their eyes. So we ain't going to never come to a proper conclusion because our mentality is just warped. We have a warped mentality of self. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Excellent. So to shift gears, but still on the yes, sir. same track. Yes, sir. I heard you mention one leader, Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But who is the leader in the Moorish Science Temple? Who's the founder? That, that, that's Prophet Noble Drew Ali. <laughs> Who is Prophet Noble Drew Ali? Well, Prophet Noble Drew Ali, let's, let's, let's go back and let's deal with, let's deal with prophetship. Prophets do not appear in vacuums. There is always a precondition when a prophet appears, you see. So what is the precondition for a man like Prophet Noble Drew Ali, a man that came to us teaching us our birthright, nationality and birthright and keys to our vast estate. You see, why would that even be necessary? Because we again are a people, it's a tree without roots. We don't know who we are, truly. See, so Allah loved us enough to send us somebody, okay, to teach us that which we did not know. Okay, so Prophet Noah Drew Ali, the founder, set up, you know, the Moorish Science Temple. And the mission of the Moorish Science Temple is to uplift the fallen humanity. So these things are established 1913 and 
further matured into 1928 and different things. And this, this movement called the Moorish American, you know, divine and national movement, divine and national movement of North America. And all of a sudden you had a bunch of so-called black people walking around with fezzes. They call it old world Islam. What do you mean old world? You know, ancient. Because we are ancient people. You see? Kind of like the fez I got on my head now. You're like, oh, that's a sign of nobility. That's because we are the nobles of the planet. You see, we are the nobles of the planet. You see, we have a royal bloodline. And our brother, Jesus, is in that bloodline, you see. But we don't have a true history of Jesus, you see. Really, he's Joshua, but, you know, that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> you know, but, but we really don't have a true history of our brother or that bloodline. I would like everybody, if, you know, in the sound of my voice to get their Bible out. And there's a small... There's a small book in the Bible called Ruth. It's only maybe a few pages. Take it out and read it. Ruth the Mobitus. A Mobitus is a female Moor. So now, Ruth is Jesus' great great grandmother. Now, think about that. You have Ruth the Mobitus. Clearly, your Bible says it just like I'm saying it. Ruth the Mobitus. Then you have Elizabeth. Then you have Mary, mother of Jesus. Now, there is no way that Ruth can be a Mobitus by bows, right? And then Elizabeth not be a Mobitus. And then Mary not be a Mobitus, which would make Jesus Hebrew Muslim, and that would make him a Moor. But we can't tell you that. <laughs> you see, that'll mess up the game we got playing here in the United States in the wild, wild west with with the Christianity. That messed that all up. See? So now we're going to do a blackout on the history so only those who are conscious of their consciousness will come at it that way. But there's a lot of information. We're in the information age. Now you could Google you know, and run down these lies that have been told to us over and over and over again. We could unravel this social engineering, this reconstructed history. We could easily do that. But the question is, is that something we really want to undertake? Because as I said at the very beginning, if we undertake that, then we're going to have to make some adjustments physically, mentally, spiritually, morally, economically. See, politically, there are going to have to be some adjustments because we are functioning right now on false concepts. You know, that's 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 how it is. You see. So yeah, we gotta we gotta straighten that out. Look up Ruth the Mobitus, and then get back at us and let us know what your findings are. But no, Prophet Noble Drew Ali taught us. Um, our nationality and birthright. He said we are Moors, we are Moroccans born in America. What? Never heard that before. Said that you know you're standing on the Moroccan Empire. Said you're standing on Africa. Wait a minute, I thought we had to go to Africa. <laughs> you know that's over there, the continent in the east. You know, no, he says here when all the land masses were connected together before the great continental drift. Our ancestors were here. Matter of fact, the Western Hemisphere was populated uh, first before the Eastern Hemisphere. So if you get a book by Horace Butler, When Rocks Cry Out, he goes into that. Talking about how a civil war broke out on this land in the Americas, in South America specifically. <laughs> and one group of Africans, <laughs> you know, left and went eastward and established a second Egypt. Well, where's the first Egypt? You're standing on it. So President Abraham Lincoln referred to this land as the Egypt of the West. Oh, wow. And if you know anything about that Egypt in the east, 
They say that had upper and lower Egypt. Well, you have a North and South America, don't you? Upper and lower Egypt. Oh, see, we've never been given that history. And there's one thing about the European, he'll never, he has to maintain plausible deniability. So when you start coming to him with these ancient records, he doesn't say anything. He just gets very quiet because he has to maintain that plausibility. Because if you speak into it, you're going to get stuck, you see. So Noble Drew Ali is bringing us our true history, ancient history, and tying it back to our divine rights, our birth right, and keys to our vast estate. And his mission is, as our mission is today, the uplift of fallen humanity. That's Noble Drew Ali in a nutshell. That's it. That's it. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so you mentioned Noble Drew Ali as founder and prophet and our history here. We mentioned black people under attack. We mentioned these elections. Mm -hmm. These elections apply to those who call themselves Moors? <laughs> it's an interesting question. <laughs> I don't think the election applies to anybody, uh, personally speaking. <laughs> you know, because number one, again, let's 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 unpackage that for just a minute though. So we, we don't want to lose anybody. For those who think they can go into this election and they feel that they have power through votes. You are operating under a granted privilege. And this is precisely why it's called a Voting Rights Act. The President of the United States has to renew the Voting Rights Act every generation. So what happens if he doesn't renew it? Are you telling me you have no votes? Is that what you want me to believe? We're not your voting rights established at the founding of what you call the United States through the United States Constitution of 1787? And the first seven articles, did that not establish what you call the United States government in 1787? Weren't your voting rights secured by the document called the U.S. Constitution? So why is it that you need a Voting Rights Act where did that come from? That's post-Civil War era. See, who is this people that need voting rights established through your 15th Amendment? Oops. <laughs> I just said, didn't your voting rights come with the United States Constitution of 1787? But yet, the 15th Amendment, which you say secures your voting rights, came post-Civil War, post-1865. How did that happen? What purpose does it serve? And why does the President of the United States need to renew it every generation or so? Hmm. See? It was for those who had no rights, slaves. And isn't it interesting that when you do your study, the United States Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court said in a landmark decision, 109 U.S. 3, the United States Supreme Court struck down the 13th Amendment with two sections, the 14th and 15th Amendments as being unconstitutional. Your 13th Amendment with two sections, you say, abolished involuntary servitude. Your 14th Amendment gives you your so-called citizenship and your 15th amendment gives you your voting rights. Oops. The United States Supreme court said on October the 15th, 1883 in that landmark decision that those three amendments were three dead badges of law. They had no validity whatsoever. That 
Supreme Court decision has never been rescinded by the Supreme Court. And it is the law of the land right now. The only reason it works is because the slaves, European and Asiatic alike, keep giving it life. You think it has validity, therefore it does. But it is unconstitutional today as it was in 1883. And to take this take this to a higher degree, the United States Congress came back in 1967 and said 14th Amendment, still unconstitutional. That was in 1967. So it is beyond me the level of ignorance that is, is just pervasive inside the country when it comes to political science. See? Because if you really understood, if we really understood what was going on, there is no need to even talk to these crazy politicians. Because all of it, in my opinion, but it ain't my opinion, all of it, in fact, is de facto. All of it. You see? So, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is what it is. So from what you're saying, most of these people, most of the people in the United States are not real citizens and are a part of a de facto government. That is exactly what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. We find it very hard to believe. See, and this is how I know the quote unquote citizen doesn't read. Most people don't even read the Constitution. If you would read the Constitution, it would tell you in Article 4, Section 4, that, the United, that all states shall be governed by a Republican form of government. All states, not some states, all states shall be governed by a Republican form of government. Well, if the Constitution, which is the supreme document of this land, says that all states shall be governed by a Republican form of government, then what is a democracy? Because none of your politicians are talking about a Republican form of government. I hear a lot of talk about the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, but that ain't a Republican form of government. So we either going to be in line with the law or we not, see? But it's easy to manipulate ignorant people, see? So yeah, all of it is de facto, meaning fake. The United States is a 10 square mile area in the District of Columbia. And anybody hearing my voice, don't take my word for it, look it up. Look up the Organic Act of 1871. This is when the Republican form of government that was established by our ancestors through the great law of peace was usurped and hijacked and taken over by a clique of criminals called the Radical Republicans in the Senate and the Congress post-Civil War. It was a conspiracy because these people did not want to compensate the slaves nor the slaveholders. They did not want to enforce the law, President Abraham Lincoln's executive will. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to enforce the four proclamations of Abraham Lincoln. They did not want to enforce the 13th Amendment with its 20 sections. They didn't want to do that. And they definitely didn't want to compensate the slaves or the slaveholders. They wanted to punish the rebellious states, referred to as the South, for their rebelling against the Union, which is older than the Constitution. You see? They wanted to punish them. So a conspiracy arose. And they swept the 13th Amendment with the, uh, with the 20 sections under the rug, along with the four proclamations of President Abraham Lincoln, 
which would have given us that compensation. It would have gave us colonization land that we could call our own and govern ourselves. Okay. We're very familiar. They love to raise Abraham Lincoln saying, well, Abraham Lincoln wanted to preserve the union. He was, you know, he said, I, as any white man would want the favorable position. First of all, Abraham Lincoln was not white in terms of nationality and pigmentation of skin. Was not. He was a Melungeon. Look that up. Twenty more, if you wanna, if you wanna, you know, Google that. You see, and that's why they called him Lincoln Africanus. Check that history out. But we ain't ready for that. See, so he was a he was a Melungeon. So he couldn't have been talking about pigmentation because if that were the case, he wouldn't fall into that bill himself. His statement wouldn't even make sense. But the statement was, I like any white man will want the superior position, but white and black, according to political science, are statuses. White means purity. Purity means God. God means ruler of the land. Who wouldn't want that position? Interesting. But then again, on the flip side of that, you have black. Civilist mortus means you have no rights. So what's happening is we as a collective people are in our feelings right now. We're looking at the color of our skin and we're saying we've been socially engineered to call ourselves black, not understanding the lawful ramifications and the legal ramifications of that. You see? And now we're in our feelings and we're trying to figure out why these things keep happening to us because we're outside of the law. And what do you do to outlaws? We've watched enough TV Westerns. No, outlaws get hunted down and ultimately murdered. That's exactly what's happening in 2020. And it's going to continue to happen with, and it's going to increase in frequency and intensity until we correct the situation. Unfortunately, you know, we need to tell you that bad news is going to happen. And I promise you, you're going to let go because it's been ordained by a law that you let go. <laughs> so you're going to let go. You see, it is what it is. You can come kicking and screaming or you can just walk in the paradise. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, Wow, that's very profound. That's very profound. Um, some key words mentioned there. <laughs> Paradise. That's the first thing that <laughs> comes to mind. And since so many of us that call ourselves Black, African American, sometimes still Negro and colored comes up. What's the remedy? What's the solution for those of us who want to get out from under this oppressive system, this beating, this <laughs> murder, just exactly. being under a, a false system? How do we how do we save ourselves? Yes, sir. That's a great question. Prophet Noble Drew Ali said we must enforce the law to save the nation. But before you can save the nation, you got to save yourself. But you can't enforce what you don't know. Hence why we have a school of law and history. But you know how we are as a collective. I ain't got no time, no classes. Now you didn't you didn't tell ASU that. <laughs> we didn't tell we didn't tell we don't tell white folks that. We we know how to pay seventy thousand dollars to go to school to come out with a piece of paper that you can't do nothing with. We know how to do that. Cause there's value in that educational system. But my point is very simple. If all you can do when you come out with your college degree is go work for somebody else. If all you could do with your college degree is come out and quote your professors, but you are not skilled enough to stand on the scholarship of your professor and look beyond him or her, then you are a damn fool in my opinion. You see? That's just foolish behavior. And you pay good money 
to do it. So we have a school of law and history. You understand? We have a school of law and history that teaches you our history and how this whole uh, mess came into existence, when it took place, how it took place, and what, more importantly, what is the remedy? What are the laws that we need to enforce to save ourselves? We actually teach that in our school of law and history. So we would encourage everyone to go to our website, MoorishAmericanNationalRepublic.com, get registered into the School of Law and History, and begin the process. It is a process. It is a process. It's not microwavable. You can't do it in two minutes or three minutes. It takes time to learn. And then the most important part is once you come out of the School of Law and History, you're, be, you're being presented with documentation. So now that you can take these documents and put them on the, on the record with the de facto government. Straighten out your status. Straighten out your condition. Notice how many times I said your in, this, in my statement. Straighten out your situation. Nobody can do it for you. No voting required, no protesting, no waiting in, no singing in, no candlelight visuals, no prayer visuals. Don't need none of that. You just need to enforce the law to save the nation. And it doesn't mean, brother and sister, that we won't suffer or won't have problems. That's another, we love, we love doing things to the extreme. So you mean tell me what? Give me a fizz and a turban. I ain't going to get shot down in the street. You can get shot down in the street any, anywhere you at on the planet. The question is, what redress will your family have? When you are molested and violated, what redress do you have as a so-called black person? I'm, I'm going to wait on somebody to answer that one for me. <laughs> what redress, do, what lawful redress do you have? You see? None. You know it. I know it. <laughs> See, they didn't get they didn't teach you that part because we are not true citizens of this country. Because we keep identifying ourselves with a slave brand and names that delude to slavery. That's not what I said. That's what Prophet Noble Drew Ali said in his divine warning of 1928. Now, whether you believe it was a divine warning, whether you believe he's a prophet or not, okay, I can respect that because you are dealing with belief. But let's look at the facts. The Chinese are not being shot down in the street. And they're here. The Koreans are not being shot down in the street. And they're here. The Europeans are not being shot down. I have never seen the police be so patient in my life with Europeans. You see, all of these individuals have nationality. Here's something else they got. Put your seatbelt on. They also have embassies. What embassy? Where's the embassy for the black man? I'll wait. Where's that at? <laughs> Where do you go? Which government do you talk to? Because you can't talk to this one. It's this government that's giving you all your grief. Because you refuse to enforce the laws of this country. On yourself. Just out of order. So the remedy is enforce the law to save the nation. That's what Prophet Noble Drew Ali said. And that's what our school of law and history does. We're trying to educate our people as to their nationality and birthright, according to Act 6. You know, this is what it's about. And then with once you know better, then you do better. That's what it's really about. Awesome. And brother, would you like to add anything else to your demonstration today?
Oh, there's a lot I could say. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> it's a lot I could say. Um, I think we should, you know, get some basic concepts down. You know, if I could get into some definitions, because I've thrown some words out here that the average person does not fully understand. Most of us, when we're looking up words, the first thing we're going to do is take out our phone and we're going to start Googling things. And based on what we Google, we think that's actually what it is. I said law governs all affairs. So what law? We're talking about political science. So one of the first things we have to do is we have to understand what words mean when it comes to law. And what words mean in law are not necessarily what they mean in political science. Or, you know, or not in political science, but in part itself. But in socially, that's what I meant. Okay. So black socially, yeah, that's a great thing. I'm black and I'm proud. Say it loud. I get it. But in law, that has a very specific meaning. It means you're civilly dead. You have no rights. Something has happened to cause your rights to be suspended or stripped. Now, we like to tie that into felonies. Well, I got a felony, so therefore, you know, I don't have any more rights. I don't have any civil rights. Who is civil? Who is civil? Who is civil that control these rights? What are civil rights? See, that's still a granted privilege. What about your human rights? What about that? Well, the question now becomes, are you human? We know what you mean socially, but according to law, you are it. You don't exist. By your own admission, you said you were black, which means you are civilly dead. You have no rights that no one is bound to respect. And the United States Supreme Court has already held that to be true. You are operating on the granted privileges. One of the most notorious cases that is studied in, this, in every law school in this country is the Dred Scott case. Why is it that you must study the Dred Scott case before you graduate law school? What is it about that case? Dred Scott, a quote unquote free man running around thinking he's free, thinking he's a citizen of the United States, decided to sue his brother-in-law, Mr. Sanford, and then found out he was in fact still a slave. Found out he could not sue into any court in this country because he himself was not considered a citizen. Black man, Dred Scott. Oh, that's another case that has never been rescinded. I know some crazy people would like to tell me that, well, the 14th Amendment overrode, uh, overrode that decision. Prove it to me. Show me the documents where that was, where it overturned the Supreme Court decision. I'll wait. I know you can't prove it. See, you're in your feelings right now. So as it was, it is today because we haven't straightened that situation out. So the thing we must do, do as a people is we must naturalize. And that was a part of President Abraham Lincoln's executive will. Naturalize them to make them citizens. I'm talking about the ex-slaves. Colonize them in a land and territory of their own that they control. Oh, that sounds like separation. <laughs> and then compensate them for their ancestors' slave labor. Give them a good set off. And for all of you uh, graduates of the HCBUs, <laughs> HBCUs. HBCUs, for all of you graduates, that those colleges come out of President Abraham Lincoln's executive will. Were we aware of that? See, that's a part of the compensation. That's a part of the colonization and the re-education of us as a people. But then of course they they flipped it. they flipped us on that. Because it seems like our leadership seems like independence is too strong. <laughs> you know, it's too much for us to handle. And, and many of us don't want to go for self. 
Yeah. Prophet Noble Drew Ali wanted us separated. Yes, separated. He wanted the executive will of President Abraham Lincoln enforced. So again, Abraham Lincoln said, I as any white man want the superior position. We have grave differences between us. You see, why shouldn't we separate? Why not? What else do you have better? Sit around and wait another hundred years for white folks, as they're called, to make up their mind to treat us better. <laughs> and I think we're getting tripped up on, you know, when we go to work and you run into little Becky and Billy and you say, well, they seem to treat me all right. I get along pretty good with them. Yeah. That's because Becky and Billy ain't challenging you for no power. See? There's no wealth transference there. So there's no threat. But it seems like when we start talking about nation time, and nationhood, all of a sudden now the threat come right to the surface. Like, what do you, what do you mean? What do you, that's not this country. You know, separate. Sure it's this country. Absolutely. This country is built on separation. How did it get started? Somebody separated from somebody else. So my position is very uh, clear to all of the Asiatics listening to my voice. If the European went to war to separate from his white brother over in England, why is it that you don't want to separate from your 400-year-old slave master? <laughs> what, what is that? And I didn't even say go to war with them. I just said separate. If you would enforce the law to save the nation, it wouldn't be no need for bloodshed. Just enforce the law. Try this on the side. Just take your money and stop spending it. Break the back of the U.S. economy overnight. Just stop spending it. Okay? Enforce the law to save the nation. That is the remedy. Correct your status. Stop coming out. Come, come from under a granted privilege, come out from under the 14th Amendment, get yourself back into your jurisdiction, one government, two jurisdictions. Get yourself back under common law and not statutory law. And I promise you, you will find the remedy right there. 99.9% .9 of your problems would go away with just that little shift in ideology and application. And someone watching this online, where could they go to get some more information on joining the class, Noble Drew Ali, and correcting their status? Uh, yeah, I would advise everyone to go to our website, MorrisAmericanNationalRepublic.com. And that website is jam-packed with all of the information, the executive will, the laws, and the historical context under which brought those laws into existence. You know, the difference between lawful and legal, the difference between um, common law and statutory law, the uh, four proclamations of Abraham Lincoln, the four constitutions. A lot of us are not aware that there were four constitutions. You see, what's the real meaning behind the Emancipation Proclamation? What does that really mean? What is a nationality? What is a birthright? How does that apply to us as a piece of uh, as a people, you see, all of that information is on our website, and then we want to encourage you to get uh, registered and signed up in our School of Law and History, so that you can really start learning in a formal way uh, what has happened to us from a lawful perspective, and then correct your status, take the oath of amnesty and reconstruction, come out of a state of rebellion, um, and then become a true citizen of the Republic, a true citizen of the Perpetual Union, and then uh, start enforcing the law to save the nation. That's what I would recommend everyone do. Go to MoorishAmericanNationalRepublic.com. Get into our School of Law and History. Study that web page. Go into our store. Purchase the books and information. We got great books, the Resurrection Book, uh, 
student orientation, naturalization handbook. It's a plethora of information on the website to really get yourself a solid foundation. You know, that's what I would do. That's what we should do. Thank you, Brother Thomas Muhammad. Yes, thank you. Yes, sir. Islam, people. <laughs>